Picture, if you will, myself, one Rodman E. Serling. But you can call me Papa. I mean, Serling, Papa, Rod, (sighs) Never mind. Witness a restaurant. To be even more specific, my restaurant. Papa Serling's Pizza. Here we provide food lovers with the best in Italian cuisine, such as delicious pizza, delightful garlic bread, and that stringy, saucy substance, spaghetti. Come on down and meet our good quality waitresses, Jess Bell and Comfort Gatewood. If you don't feel like coming into our location on Maple Street, just simply make a long distance call and we'll be happy to get your order out to you. Also, come on down and try our slot machines. Just be careful not to take it too far. Must be 21 or older to gamble. So, come on down to Papa Serling's Pizza, where you can get a cow zone in the Twilight Zone. Come on down to Papa Serling's Pizza. It's a restaurant, a high quality restaurant. In fact, you might even say it's one for the angels. You're in the middle. Between the two. But for you. Where are we? Between light and shadow. Hey gang, it's Craig, and you've stumbled your way into Between Light and Shadow, a Twilight Zone podcast, where we uh, talk about the Twilight Zone and stuff. That was our buddy Dylan Vance providing our cold open bit this week, so thanks for that, Dylan. Now, we've been slowly making our way through the legendary first season of Rod Serling's immortal series, The Twilight Zone, obviously. And this week, we arrive at the two-thirds point. This week, we are looking at our 24th Season 1 episode out of a total 36. But it's not episode number 24, since we aren't going in any kind of chronological order. In fact, this particular episode aired at the very end of the season. Almost. It was the penultimate Season 1 episode, and as we'll see, it has some interesting backstory associated with it. But first, did you catch the X-Files a couple weeks ago, where they did the whole Mulder's first Twilight Zone bit? The first Twilight Zone episode you ever saw was The Lost Martian, right? You remember that? And if I do? That Twilight Zone episode doesn't exist. It never did. We can follow it. It'd be a hell of a twist if it were Ron Serling. Submitted for your approval. Seriously, I backed that thing up at least ten times, laughing hysterically each and every time. The Twilight Zone has frequently been cited over the years as a major influence on the X-Files, and you can certainly trace some episodes directly back to the Twilight Zone, particularly those written by Vince Gilligan, who, like all of us, proudly calls TZ his favorite show of all time. So it was nice to see it finally explicitly acknowledged. And yes, gently kidded in the process. It's not in here either. But Mulder, what I don't understand is how this guy knew about your secret rendezvous signal. Who cares about any of that, Scully? I can't find the lost Martian. When, when he said that that episode of The Twilight Zone didn't exist, that's when I knew he was a crazy person. It's a classic. So I came over and I checked my box DVD set and it wasn't on there. I checked all my episode guidebooks, no mention of it. I had to search down the line, nothing. So now I'm going through my tapes because I'm sure I recorded it at some point. Well, maybe it's one of those other shows, like Outer Limits. Or... Confuse The Twilight Zone with The Outer Limits? Do you even know me? Can we talk about this over dinner? Please? Uh, I'm not going to be able to eat until I find this ever again. It can't be that good of an episode. It's, it's not about the episode, Scully. It's about my memory of seeing my first Twilight Zone. Yeah. <laughs> Calls to mind that classic Albert Brooks, Dan Aykroyd exchange from Twilight Zone, the movie. Did you ever watch the Twilight Zone? Remember the one where the guy had the stopwatch? 
and somebody in a bar gave him a stopwatch and he was this real obnoxious guy and he took the stopwatch and he hit it and everybody else in time froze but him that's an outer limits no that was his own that's an outer limits that was his own But the mention of the outer limits in an otherwise Twilight Zone specific scene provides a marvelous segue into an exciting bit of news that I am now officially allowed to share. Remember a few months or so back when I predicted that the podcast would likely suffer some interruptions because of some other projects that had fallen my way? Well, we've known for a while that The Outer Limits is finally coming out on Blu-ray, but it's only been recently that specific details have emerged. A little while back, we got a release date, March 27th for season one, and a date to be determined later in 2018 for season two. But over the last few weeks, the picture has become much clearer. Season one is available for pre-order on Amazon, the cover art has been unveiled, and now, details regarding the supplemental material have been made public, and that's where I come in. Listeners, I am proud to announce that I contributed three audio commentaries for the set, covering the episodes Obit, Corpus Earthling, and Specimen Unknown. I'll also be contributing least three more commentaries for this season two set, so I guess I didn't screw up too bad on the first ones. Now, listeners familiar with my Outer Limits blog will know that I've been impatiently waiting for a high-def release for frickin' years now, so the fact that it's finally coming out on Blu-ray is amazing enough, but to actually be part of it is almost unbelievable. I mean, it's already happened, I already recorded them, but part of me still can't believe it. It's slowly becoming more real since it's been officially announced and stuff, but when I hold that set in my hands and I see my name on the back cover and in the accompanying booklet and I load up the discs and I actually hear my own annoying voice pour forth, then and only then will it be truly real. Still surreal, I'm sure, but real just the same. I mean, obviously I can already listen to myself doing something very similar on this podcast any time I want to, but it's not quite the same. It's not as, I don't know, tangible. If the internet completely collapses at some point and all my podcasts are lost, those Blu-rays will still exist. It's a legitimate physical artifact It will live on past me. It will be proof that I existed. So what I'm saying is I'm basically immortal now. So mark your calendars and pony up the pre-order money, folks. March 27th, 2018, The Outer Limits Season 1 on Blu-ray and DVD from Kino Lorber. I should also mention that our very good friend, Dr. Reba Wisner, is also represented. She contributed four commentaries to the set. So, while this podcast is never once mentioned, I think the closest I got was introducing myself as a podcaster on one of them. Well, there's still a palpable between light and shadow vibe therein. But back to the X-Files. When it first started out way back in 1993, it was a pretty somber, serious show. I mean, Mulder certainly did a bit of wisecracking here and there, but the stories themselves were pretty serious. As the series progressed, they injected more and more humor into the proceedings, particularly in the episodes written by Darren Morgan. Classics like Humbug, Jose Chung's From Outer Space, War of the Coprophages, all Darren Morgan. And when the show first came back in 2015, after 15 years off the air, he wrote arguably the best episode of the new season, Mulder and Scully Meet the Wear Monster. Now his latest, The Lost Art of Forehead Sweat, seriously, that's that's the title, with its Twilight Zone and Outer Limits references, is Vintage Morgan, and it's wonderful. The X-Files was a show that loosened up as it matured, all for the better. It found a really successful balance between dark, serious material and comedy. It's not an easy balance to achieve. Just ask the Twilight Zone. 
Oh, come on. You know I'm right. We'll get into this a bit more later, but it's a proven fact that Rod Serling uh, wasn't comedically gifted, at least not on the Twilight Zone. He was certainly wry enough, obviously witty, definitely clever, but straight up comedic? Like sitcom level Jerry Lewis type comedy? That's a hard no, Houston. Enough unfunny foreplay. Let's get into this. Grab yourself a hot dog, maybe some fresh roasted peanuts, and settle in as we throw out the opening pitch for The Mighty Casey, which premiered June 17th, 1960. Play ball! Oh, look! It's that rare eyeball opening sequence that was only used in the last five or six episodes of season one. Kind of a weird choice, changing it so close to the end of the season. Even weirder was the choice to change it again for season two. So what you end up with is this little handful of episodes that kick off with this short, surreal shot of an eyeball that turns into a setting sun, then the show name, the Twilight Zone, for those who may have wandered into the wrong podcast, even the font is different. Simple block letters. I actually like this opening quite a bit. So we start off with some nice, ominous opening music, and then a baseball field? Immediate disconnect. How dramatic or ominous can baseball possibly be? But nice production value, shooting on a real baseball field. Now, Serling's already told us that the team is the Hoboken Zephyrs, and that it's tryout day. Grand looking bunch of boys, huh? Who are you expecting, the All-Stars? Uh, you stick up a tryout sign for a last division club that happens to be 31 games out of first. This is the material you usually round up. This is the material you usually round up. You're general manager of this club. Why don't you get me some ball players? You'd know what to do with them? Hey, that's Corey from The Lonely. Does this take place before The Lonely? Before he gets his life sentence? Is he going to murder somebody on the team? Oh, wait. His name isn't Corey. Never mind. Though... A prequel to The Lonely would have been vastly preferable, as we'll soon see. 20 games out of fourth place, and the only big average we got is a manager with the widest mouth in either league. Maybe you better get reminded, when the Hoboken Zephyrs win one game, we gotta call it a streak. Oh, buddy boy, when contract time comes around, you don't have to. That's weird. Between the two of them, I'd say Beasley's got a way bigger mouth. McGarry just seems tired. So anyway, these are the Hoboken Zephyrs, and it seems they suck. They suck hard. They're dead last in the league. A pitcher shows up to try out, and McGarry is so desperate, he'll give anybody a shot. Want to look at a pitcher? He's a lefty. Lefty schmefty. What's the difference? He's got more than one arm and less than four. He's for us. A lanky, blank-faced guy named Casey arrives, accompanied by one Dr. Stillman. Now, right off the bat, ha, <laughs> see what I did there? Bat. Casey seems really unfamiliar with social customs. The doc has to coach him on how to shake hands. Then he practically breaks McGarry's hand when he shakes it. And this bit goes on way too long, by the way. So long that the prologue time runs out and we go to commercial. Oh, I should mention that before the endless handshake, a pop fly lands right on Casey's head, but he isn't phased in the least. He doesn't even seem to notice. Hmm. Back from commercial, and Jesus, the handshake is still going on. The doc finally tells Casey to stop, much to McGarry's and our relief. Casey heads out to the mound to show his stuff. Show me what you got! And that was for you, Brandon. Fellow Twilight Zone podcaster Brandon Cruz from Submitted for Your Approval also does a Rick and Morty podcast. And that was a clip from a Rick and Morty episode entitled Get Swifty. Oh, yeah. You gotta get Swifty. You gotta get Swifty in here. It's time to get Swifty. Oh, oh. Get Swifty? What the hell is that? Oh, yeah. It's Swifty time today. And hey, 
I was a guest on Brandon's show a while back when he covered the season two, episode 22, which we've mentioned here on this podcast lately due to the Arlene Sachs connection. Room for one more, honey. I'll put a link in the show notes. Check it out. And while you're there, check out all the other episodes that I'm not into. Definitely worth your podcast listening time. And hey, Brandon. I like what you got. Good job. It was father? His father? Casey's? Oh, no, no. He has no father. Well, I am what you might call his, uh, well, kind of uh, creator. How old is he? How old is he? Well, now, that's a little difficult to say. Now, what I mean is, it's uh, hard to be chronological when discussing Casey's age, because uh, he's only been in existence three weeks. What? How? What? You see, I made Casey. I built him. He's a robot. But here's the thing. Casey is a phenomenal pitcher. And at this point, we're treated to a series of goofy bits where he throws a fastball, then a curveball, then a slow ball. I mean, we don't see any of it. We see McGarry reacting to it, complete with comedic sound effects. That's his fastball. That's his curve. That's his snowball. He's a bit late. All right, let me see that fastball. All right, the slow ball. Because, see, this is a comedy. The sight gags and the sound effects are there to tell us that it's funny, because we might not realize it otherwise. So, robot or no, McGarry needs to pull his team out of last place, so naturally, he signs Casey, ignoring any potential ethical issues that may arise. He's rough, Doc. He's, he's plenty rough, but I think we can give him a try. He's, uh, he's a robot, you know? Don't ever say that. That's why we'll just keep the family here, huh? Yeah. Don't ever say the word R-O-B-B-O-T-T. Oh, boy. Now, actually, this could be a sequel to The Lonely. Corey's back on Earth after his pardon, and he's tried to move on with his life, but he just can't shake his experience with Alicia. Because, you know, once you've had a robot, real flesh and blood just doesn't quite do the job anymore. Maybe he's giving Casey a shot in the hopes that Dr. Stillman might build him another Alicia. Beasley, draw the contract. The only thing that stands between us as a pennant is if this guy's battery goes dead or he rushes in the rain. In short... He pitches like nothing human. When Serling adapted some of his Twilight Zone teleplays into short story form, the mighty Casey showed up in the first paperback collection. On the jacket read, Meet Casey, who pitched like nothing human because he wasn't. Act two opens with Casey's first game. What's in this for you, Doc? Oh, just scientific. It's all purely experimental. You know, I think Casey's some sort of a superman. I'd like to have that proven. But once I built a home economist, a marvelous cook, I gained 46 pounds before I had to dismantle her. Wait, is this guy related to Dr. Loren from the lateness of the hour? Now, with Casey's skills, I consider that with his strength and accuracy, he'd be a baseball pitcher. Now, in order to have that proved, I had to have a pitching competition. And as an acid test, to pitch in absolutely the worst ball team I could find. Thanks a lot, Doc. You got a lot of class. Well, Mr. McGarry, what team is uh, Casey pitching against? The New York Giants. Oh, I'd love to beat those Giants. But for that matter, I'd love to beat Cincinnati or Philadelphia or the Braves or even the Hicksville Bullets. They beat us 11 or nothing in spring training. Oh, I think Casey will come through for you, Mr. McGarry. And he does, predictably enough, leading the Zephyrs to an easy victory over the Giants. We are then treated to a montage of clips showing Casey single-handedly taking the Zephyrs to first place, which ends with a loud sound. and a newspaper headline that reads, Casey Beaned. Wait, we saw Casey get beaned earlier and it didn't seem to hurt him at all. But apparently, this time it constitutes a potentially serious injury. Now, right under that headline, the text indicates that Casey has been hospitalized for examination. 
why would they hospitalize someone just to examine them? So he's at the hospital, but it's the team doctor doing the examining. Maybe this is my lack of sports medicine knowledge talking, but would the team doctor actually go with him to the hospital and conduct the examination himself versus, you know, the ER doctor looking him over? And the game was still going on, right? So wouldn't the team doctor stay there in case somebody else got hurt? Or did they actually stop the game because of this, since the coach and the general manager left too? And wouldn't you think they'd have checked his vitals immediately when he got hit before carting him off to the hospital? No fracture, no concussion, reflexes seem normal. I think you're going to be all right, Mr. Casey. And then he goes in for a pulse check. This man doesn't have any pulse, no uh, heartbeat. This man isn't alive. Uh, Doctor, I think you should know this before you go any further. Uh, This man hasn't a pulse or a heartbeat because he doesn't have a heart. He's a robot. Wait, this just occurred to me. Wouldn't Casey have been required to undergo a physical before joining the team in the first place? How did this ruse ever get this far? He's been pitching for the Hoboken Zephyrs. Under the circumstances, as team physician, I'm afraid I must notify the baseball commissioner. Oh, okay, guess what, Now You've really done it. I'm going to call my boss. Yeah, you do that, tattletits. Fucking narc. Article 6, Section 2, the baseball code. A team shall consist of nine men. Men, understand? Not robots. He's suspended. That's my final decision. Commissioner, to all intents and purposes, he is human. Casey, talk to him. Tell him about yourself. Um, this feels really familiar. Talk to them, Alicia. Show them. Alicia, show them. I don't have any choice, Corey. I have no choice at all. No! No! Oh, shit. Is Alan being going to show up and blow Casey's face off? How could he be human without a heart? Beasley hasn't got a heart either. He owns 40% of the club. Jeez. That's it, gentlemen. He doesn't have a heart. That means he isn't human. That's a clear violation of the baseball code. Therefore, he doesn't play. Mr. Commissioner, suppose we gave him a heart. If that's the essential thing that makes him different, I think I could operate and supply him with a heart. You can do that. No trouble at all. All right, all right. With a heart. I'll give him a temporary okay until the league meeting in October. Then we'll have to take it up. So giving a fake person a fake heart makes them human? (sighs) Funny little trivia tidbit. Jack Warden appeared in a 1955 episode of Goodyear Playhouse called The Mechanical Heart. So they put a heart into Casey and he returns to the team but now he has a smile on his face. Listen, Mr. McGarry. (laughs) You got a heart. Look at his smile. That's the one thing I couldn't get him to do. Yeah, it's wonderful. Just wonderful. I feel like togetherness. Casey returns to the mound, but every batter he faces has no trouble hitting his pitches. The Zephyrs lose their first game since Casey first joined the team. Back in the locker room, Casey explains the change. The thing is, Mr. McGarry, I I just couldn't strike those poor fellows out. I didn't have it in me to do that, to hurt their feelings. I felt compassion. That's it, he's got compassion. See how he smiles? Give a man a heart, Mr. McGarry, particularly someone like Casey, who hasn't been around long enough to understand uh, competitiveness or drive or ego. I'm sorry, Mr. McGarry. I just can't hurt fellas' careers. Casey leaves to pursue a new career in social work, and on his way out, Dr. Stillman leaves Casey's blueprints with McGarry as a memento. McGarry's eyes light up, and he chases after Stillman. Wait, wait. Hey, Doc, wait a minute! Doc! Hey, Doc, wait a minute! Once upon a time, there was a Major League Baseball team called the Hoboken Zephyrs, who during the last year of their existence wound up in last place and shortly thereafter wound up in oblivion. There's a rumor, unsubstantiated of course, that a manager named McGarry took them to the West Coast and wound up with several pennants and a couple of world's championships. This team had a pitching staff that made history. Of course, none of them smiled very much. 
but it happens to be a fact that they pitched like nothing human. And if you're interested as to where these gentlemen came from, you might check under B for baseball in the Twilight Zone. Okay, so every now and then, Serling would choose, for reasons unknown, to drag the Twilight Zone kicking and screaming into comedy territory. And for the most part, these attempts at humor would fail spectacularly. There are exceptions, of course. Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up is pretty amusing. Showdown with Rance McGrew as well. And of course, there's The Night of the Meek, which has some genuinely funny moments. But that one's more of a heartwarming fairy tale than a comedy. And maybe that's the key to successful comedy in the Twilight Zone. Context. If you have moments of light comedy that occur naturally within a softer, gentler type of story, it makes sense. But comedy for comedy's sake... Going for the boffo laughs with pratfalls and sight gags and goofy sound effects. It just doesn't work. Not on the Twilight Zone. By and large, Serling's comedic efforts fall flat. And some of the more egregious examples are Mr. Beavis, Cavender is Coming, The Whole Truth, Mr. Dingle the Strong, Four O'Clock, The Bard. All terrible. The bard is an interesting animal. I actually like the concept quite a bit, and some of the situational humor does work, but it's generally reviled, at least in the Twilight Zone circles in which I travel. I personally don't find it nearly as offensive as my colleagues, but this is beside the point. How does the mighty Casey stack up against these other attempts at humor? It actually fares all right. Yes, it's stupid. And yes, it doesn't really belong in the Twilight Zone. But, well, oh wait, back up. What do I mean when I say it doesn't really belong? I think we can look at the series as a whole and apply a checklist of sorts to determine just how zone any given episode is. I'm not talking scientific precision here. I don't have charts and graphs and stats, but we can tick off boxes. Does the mighty Casey comment in any meaningful way on important themes or societal ills? War, violence, greed, racism? No. Does the mighty Casey probe the intricate psyche of man? Fear, nostalgia, identity, guilt? No. Is The Mighty Casey an adaptation of an existing fantasy or science fiction short story, one that has a TZ feel, despite not originating with Serling or the usual stable of TZ writers? No. Lacking any of these qualities, is The Mighty Casey a good story well told? Uh, no, not Really? I mean, I realize that that last one is completely subjective. I mean, you might love this episode. I don't. For me, it doesn't fit into the Twilight Zone at all. Okay, it does have a robot. And the Twilight Zone has several robot-centric episodes, so I guess it fits in that respect. And I guess it sort of does pose the Blade Runner question. What's the Blade Runner question, you ask? It's basically this. What's the line that separates man from artificial man? Or, put another way, can an artificial being have a soul? The Mighty Casey does sort of touch on this, but being a comedy, it doesn't really attempt to scratch that concept's surface, much less probe its depths. I mean, there's really no assertion that having a fake heart makes Casey human, but still. So, even if the Mighty Casey does squeak through on a conceptual basis, it still doesn't feel like a Twilight Zone to me. But it's not really up to me, is it? Rod Serling himself wrote it for the Twilight Zone, it was produced on the Twilight Zone, and it survived almost 60 years as a Twilight Zone. So it's a Twilight Zone. 
It's no shadow play. It's no eye of the holder. It's no, well, lots and lots and lots of better episodes. But it's also no Mr. Beavis or Four O'Clock or a few others that I actively despise. And somewhere out there, it's probably somebody's favorite episode ever. Serling clearly had some semblance of love for it, as evidenced by the fact that he, well, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this aspect of the episode, mostly because it's been covered to death in every book and every podcast whenever The Mighty Casey comes up, but happily, a very concise and brief summation can be found on, yep, you guessed it. According to the Twilight Zone Unlocking the Door to a Television Classic by Martin Grahams, the... Well, okay, maybe I shouldn't be attributing this to Wikipedia. Hang on, let me grab my copy of the Grahams book. Let's see, where's the index? The Mighty Casey, page 300. All right. All right, let me, let me just scan through this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Graham's account is much longer, like two whole pages. But the Wikipedia entry hits all the main points, and they do make a point of citing him as a reference. So, okay, yeah, I think we're good to proceed. According to The Twilight Zone, Unlocking the Door to a Television Classic by Martin Grams, the entire production was originally filmed with Paul Douglas in the manager role. Douglas previously played a baseball team manager in the 1951 film Angels in the Outfield. On Friday, September 11, 1959, the day after the episode finished shooting, Douglas died. Douglas had been, unbeknownst to anyone, suffering from an incipient coronary during the production. His performance was adversely affected, as on film, Douglas appeared mottled and out of breath. Writer and executive producer Rod Serling felt that the circumstances of Douglas's death, he was quite literally dying on camera, cast a pall over what was supposed to be a light-hearted comedic episode, and decided that a reshoot was necessary. CBS refused to finance any reshooting, so consequently, virtually the entire production was refilmed at the expense of Rod Serling's Cayuga Productions, with Jack Warden in the team manager's role. The other roles were not recast, and as much footage from the original filming was used as possible, including in the episode's final shot, a scene in which Douglas is seen in the distance with his back to the camera as the manager. Original director Alvin Ganser was not available for the reshoot, so Robert Parrish was brought in to complete shooting. Both are credited as directors on the finished episode. So was it all worth it? I think you know my opinion. I would have spent that money on a new, better episode, but that's just me. Your TZ mileage may vary does have a fascinating history, and while I do understand Serling's reasoning, I personally wish they'd aired the episode as shot, especially since it was Paul Douglas' last performance. I wish the Douglas footage at least still existed so we could compare it with Jack Warden's take. Oh yeah, I didn't even cover the cast yet, did I? And I'll tell you something else, you guys. From now on, there's going to be a ghost in the dugout. Number seven. Oh, number seven. Okay, so Mouth McGarry was played by Jack Warden, who we know as Corey from The Lonely. Dr. Stillman was played by Abraham Sofer, who is probably best remembered in genre circles as Arch, the leader of the time-traveling Kaiban Goon Squad on the Outer Limits episode, Demon with a Glass Hand. Third floor, EO2, Alvarado passport photos. We'll win, Trent. In the end, we'll win. They're all gone, every last man on Earth. Just you.
As we reported very recently, Demon with a Glass Hand also starred Arlene Sachs, who appeared in the Twilight Zone episode What You Need, which, hey, was directed by Alvin Ganser, who directed all the deleted Paul Douglas footage in The Mighty Casey. Small world. Well, that wouldn't make me nervous. I don't know anyone named Joe DiMaggio. Let's see here. Casey was played by Robert Sorrells, who, holy shit, is serving a life sentence for murder. For this, I'm going to read from a blog entry by David K. Frazier, and I'll put a link in the show notes. The 74-year-old actor was retired and living in a low-income senior citizen's complex in Simi Valley, California, when an argument in a bar on July 4th, 2004, turned deadly. The night before, Sorrels drank until closing at the Regency Lounge, a seedy downtown bar located on Los Angeles Avenue and Galt Street, about 20 miles northwest of LA. The next morning, he visited the tavern to inquire about a lost credit card, returning later in the afternoon to resume drinking. Sorrels harassed a female bartender to the extent that Arthur DeLong, a 45-year-old painting contractor who was drinking at the tavern, escorted the elderly man outside. Sorrels drove his Volkswagen minibus back to his apartment in Haywood Gardens, retrieved a semi-automatic pistol, and returned to the Regency Lounge around 5 p.m. What transpired next was captured on silent videotape from a surveillance camera mounted in the ceiling above the bar. Sorrels, a silver-haired man with a Colonel Sanders-type goatee, walked into the bar, held the gun to DeLong's back, fired, and shot another round at the man as he lay dead on the barroom floor. The former Western actor then turned the gun on another patron seated at the bar, Edward Sanchez, 40, shooting him in the face and back. Sanchez survived the attack. Stunned patrons recall prior to exiting the bar, Sorrels shouted, Does anybody else want to fuck with the cowboy? Simi Valley police apprehended the retired actor in his van minutes later, three blocks from the shootout, and booked him in the Ventura County Jail on suspicion of murder and attempted murder. A detective later testified that five hours after the shooting, Sorrels' blood alcohol level was still more than twice the legal limit. Robert Sorrels is now 87 years old, and he's still serving his life sentence. Jesus, there's a whole lot of tragedy swirling around this innocent little quote-unquote comedy. Yeah, I know that sounded kind of condescending. I don't know, maybe the mighty Casey was legitimately funny back in 1960. Times change, humor changes, maybe that's the problem. What we find funny now is partly due to the almost 60 years of history that's happened since this episode aired. I don't know if humor now is more sophisticated, it's just different. But there are Twilight Zone comedies that transcend the potential unkindness of time's passage. So, man, I I don't know. I feel like I'm spending too much time rationalizing this one out. It's supposed to be funny. I don't find it funny. Maybe I would have in 1960. I'll never know. Time to move on. Oh, and one more indication that Serling held the mighty Casey in high regard... It was one of the six season one episodes he converted to short story form for his paperback Stories from the Twilight Zone. Not only that, but it's the very first story in the book. Not Where Is Everybody, not Walking Distance, The Mighty Casey. That's what Serling chose to lead off his first in a trilogy of Twilight Zone story collections, which was first published in 1960, April 1960 to be exact. So wait, that means the short story was made available before the episode actually aired in June of that year. So if you snatched up that book when it was first released, you had the rare chance to read A Twilight Zone before you could see it. Another weird trivia bit that sets this episode apart. Man, it bums me out that such a mediocre episode has such a rich backstory. Ugh. Happily, The Mighty Casey wasn't the show's only male robot-centric offering. It would take a few years, but the Alpha Automaton would finally have its day on January 3rd, 1963, with the season 4 premiere in his image, which opens with a 
brand new opening title sequence. Now this is probably the most recognizable of them all. They'd use it for both the fourth and fifth seasons, a total of 54 episodes. So percentage wise, this opening got the most play by far. So we're at both ends of the spectrum this week. We saw the rarest opening sequence and now we're seeing the most common. Now this one includes visual elements specific to Serling's comments. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. We see a door floating in space. Beyond it is another dimension. The door opens to show us a window floating in space. A dimension of sound. Which shatters. A dimension of sight. Then we see an eyeball also floating in space. Okay, everything here is floating in space. A dimension of mind. Then we see Einstein's famed formula to represent mass energy equivalence, E equals MC squared. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance. We then see a mannequin swim by. Well, it looks like it's swimming. Then a ticking clock. Of things and ideas. And then we see the name of the show in a different font than we've ever seen before. And side note, this is the same version of the show's logo that you will find on every cover of every issue of Rod Serling's The Twilight Zone magazine, which ran from April 1981 to June 1989. You've just crossed over into The Twilight Zone. And hey, what the hell? There's no the in the title. Now it's just Twilight Zone. And then we don't pan down from the starry sky as we've done for the past three seasons. This time we simply dissolve to the opening shot of the episode. Man, did they change everything? Night, a city street. A man walks out of a hotel and checks his watch. It's 4.45 a.m. So, okay, it's morning, but the sun's not up, so it's still night, right? He meanders down into a nearby subway tunnel, and as he waits for the train, he suddenly hears a burst of loud, mechanical, mad scientist movie-type sounds, which clearly disturbs him. He turns to see an old woman standing there. Oh, I didn't hear you. Are you sick, young man? You look sick. My husband looked like that just before he died. All white and pasty. <laughs> no, no, I'm all right. You don't drink, do you? No. Uh, that's what killed my Jack. I told him it was the devil's work, but he wouldn't listen to me. And you can see where he is now. And then she kicks it into high gear with a rollicking evangelistic revival type sermon. Oh, the devil's all around us, mister. All around us, everywhere we go. And if we don't fight him... If we don't stand up to him, we suffer eternal torment. Yeah, I'm sure you're right. I know I'm right, and I'll tell you how I know. Can I get a hallelujah? It was on a Sunday. I was ironing, if you please. And that's when it came out of a clear blue sky. Oh, the dear good Lord's own sweet breath and his voice. Like an electric shock, I was revelated. Oh, praise him. She's played by Catherine Squire, who was already a Twilight Zone vet by the time she appeared here. She played Joseph Wiseman's old school teacher in season three's One More Pallbearer. She also did a few Alfred Hitchcock hours and the Portrait Without a Face episode of Boris Karloff's Thriller in 1961. A judgment. That's what his death was. A judgment from on high. <laughs> on high is good. He was shot through the skylight, you know. Wham! Dead as a mackerel. Do you read the book? What book is that? Why, the good book. Oh, yes, all the time. You sure you're telling the truth now? We may be a mile underground, but he hears every word. Yes, it's the truth. Now, this guy's having none of it. He starts to hear those disturbing mechanical sounds again. She presses a religious tract into his hand, which he stuffs into his pocket. Then she really starts ranting at him. 
and then the train approaches, and he does what any sensible person would do in his shoes. He grabs the old lady and, at the proper moment, throws her in front of the train. And then he does what any sensible person would do in his shoes. He runs like hell. Then Serling steps in to offer his opening comments. But he doesn't step in to the scene, as he historically has. This time he's not even there in the scene. We get to him via a dissolve. He addresses us in front of a generic gray background. What you have just witnessed could be the end of a particularly terrifying nightmare. It isn't. It's the beginning. Although Alan Talbot doesn't know it, he's about to enter a strange new world. Too incredible to be real, too real to be a dream. It's called The Twilight Zone. Little side note. In Twilight Zone the movie, some of Serling's narrations were pilfered and repurposed for Burgess Meredith's off-camera narrator comments. That first part... What you have just witnessed could be the end of a particularly terrifying nightmare. It isn't. It's the beginning. ...was reused for the remake of Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. What you're looking at could be the end of a particularly terrifying nightmare. It isn't. It's the beginning. So, our Jehovah's Witness murdering friend Alan Talbot is played by George Grizzard, who also headlined season one's The Chaser, which we haven't covered yet, but we most certainly will in good time. There, he plays a lovelorn man who resorts to uh, unusual means to win the affections of the breathtaking Patricia Berry. Hello, Leela. Roger, I told you I was busy tonight. Well, just a minute, just a little minute. Flowers, see? That's very nice, Roger. Thank you. Now, if you'll just run along. I couldn't have lasted the evening without seeing you, Leela. You don't know what it's like to love somebody, to love anybody so much and so desperately. Look, champagne. Just enough for two glasses. Now, that's not asking much, is it? Just spare me five minutes and have one drink with me. George Grizzard was a celebrated Emmy and Tony Award-winning actor. Aside from his two Twilight Zones, his sci-fi fantasy horror genre work consisted of one episode of One Step Beyond, a few Alfred Hitchcock Presents, and an episode of Thriller in 1960, the very first Thriller, in fact, titled The Twisted Image. I was him. I'd have a wonderful apartment on the river. A wife like her, a real lady, and I'd be where I belong. The music that opens Act 1 is from the Season 1 episode, The Big Tall Wish, which we haven't covered yet, but we will. All in good time, my pretties. It's a Jerry Goldsmith original. The cue is called The Cruel Past, but I gotta say... There's nothing cruel about this lovely young lady lighting up a smoke under the opening titles. That's the stunning Gail Coby, previously seen in Season 1's A World of Difference and Season 5's The Self-Improvement of Salvador Ross, both of which we have covered here on the podcast, lest y'all think we've been slacking. I think I've been very clear on this particular issue in the past, but let me reiterate for the record, Gail Kobe is a bona fide goddess, and somehow the usual TZ babe jingle just doesn't seem adequate. It needs something extra. That chick that won't quit, it's like stacked, like beautiful. <laughs> you got me straight tripping, boo. <laughs> There. Now, Outer Limits fans will know she also did two episodes on that series, Specimen Unknown and Keeper of the Purple Twilight. And yes, I do acknowledge my huge crush on her in my commentary for Specimen Unknown on the Blu-ray. I want the world to know! So, there's a knock at the door. And who is it but our old lady slay and pal, Alan Talbot himself? They seem friendly. Familiar. He's probably not there to kill her, too. And then they're kissing, and now I'm seething with jealousy. (laughs) I told you that there were lines that I did not cross. I know. I was going to wait till after we got married, but something came over me. I lost my self-control. You look around for it, and I'll get you some coffee. (laughs) The real irony here? George Grizzard was gay, so he didn't even want to be kissing Gail Kobe. (sighs) How come so late? What, five minutes? No, 45 minutes. 
Honey, I keep telling you to get rid of that sundial. Okay, so you overslept. Just remember, it wasn't my idea to leave at 5 o'clock in the morning. Look, I did not oversleep. I left the hotel at 4.30 a.m. I got on the subway, I got off the subway, I came here, therefore... Therefore, you must have stopped someplace and had a few short beers. Because now it's almost 6. He checks his watch. And sure enough, just like the lady said, it's 5 minutes to 6. He's clearly a bit bothered by this. The implication is that he has no memory of at least part of the 55 minutes that have elapsed since he left his hotel. He's lost some time. But hey, no matter. He's got Gail Kobe on hand playing his girlfriend, Jessica Connolly. Well, I guess she's more than just a girlfriend because... Jess? Yeah? Are you sure? What do you mean? I mean, do you know what you're doing? Yes, I do. I am a, a spinster. Well over 20 years old. And I am sound of mind and sound of body. Hell yeah, you are. Ow! I'm going to visit a town that I have never seen before for the purpose of meeting and impressing a woman I've never heard of before. For the purpose of marrying a guy I've known for exactly four days. Alan's taking her to his hometown of Corville, New York to meet his Aunt Mildred. On the drive, he dozes off while Jess drives and he has a bit of a nightmare. Walter. Walter, no. No, it isn't right. Send me back. Jess pulls the car over. Uh, Alan. Uh, Alan. Uh, Alan. Uh, you were having a nightmare. Hmm. What, in the middle of the morning? <laughs> Who's Walter? Who's who? You kept saying Walter. I don't know any Walter. Well, maybe awake you don't know any Walter, but asleep you're scared to death of him. I said I don't know any Walter. Okay, you big grouch. I wonder if inside George Grizzard was screaming, Oh my God, get off me! Hey, you see that road? <laughs> Love Alley, we used to call it. Great place for sparking the girlies. And how would you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, George. Oh, my love, in sparking circles, I was known as the human electrode. The human electrode. Well, what am I getting into? Uh. <laughs> Inside that handsome head of his, George Grizzard is either laughing hysterically or sobbing in sheer agony. Okay, I know it sounds like I'm making light of the difficult time gay people had at the time when they were forced to fake being straight, but that's not how I mean it. And besides, comedy is not pretty. So they get to Corville and things get weird. He's only been gone for a week, yet the town is different. There are buildings where there weren't any before. Alan goes to buy Jess a cup of coffee at a restaurant, which doesn't exist. The university where he's worked for the past 10 years is now an empty lot. It's as though 20 years have gone by, everything's different. So. Maybe this is a variation on walking distance. Only instead of Martin sloning his way back in time, he's Joseph caswell his way forward. Spoiler alert, it's neither. We started in the present day, well, 1963 present day, and we're still in the present day. And it gets worse. And Mildred! And Mildred! And Mildred! What do you want? I'm Alan Talbot. So? So, I happen to live here. Now, would you mind telling me who you are and what you're doing in my are you house? crazy or something? Wait a minute, where's Aunt Mildred? Now listen, mister, let me tell you something. You, you made some kind of a mistake. I live here. I've lived here for nine years. I don't know anybody named Mildred, and I don't know you either. Now you get off my property or I'll call the sheriff. That guy, by the way, is played by Wallace Rooney. No relation to Mr. Rooney, the principal from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Rooney! 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 Wallace Rooney is a TZ3 timer. He's also in the third season episode Young Man's Fancy and in season two's The Rip Van Winkle Caper. He's the guy who rolls up in the Forbidden Planet car at the end and finds Oscar Beregi baking in the sun with his worthless bars of gold. So now Alan's really confused. And then, as if on cue. Uh oh. <laughs> Straighten up? Sure, I'm out of my mind. Oh, Alan. Well, I don't know what else to think. What else can I think? Somebody I never saw before living in my house? Uh, this is going to sound crazy, I know. But do you remember what you said when we tried to get coffee at that hotel? You said it was as though Corville had, had aged 20 years. 
20 years in a week? Well, maybe not in one week. What if 20 years have gone by? Well, Rip Van Winkle? That doesn't hold up for a lot of reasons. For one thing, it would make me at least 45 years old unless I left town when I was 10. And that couldn't be because I went to high school and college here. Except there aren't any records showing I ever went to Courville High. And the university I work for, dear old Courville U, doesn't even exist. It never existed. What about your aunt? I just checked. There's not a trace of evidence that a Mildred Talbot ever lived here. Come on. Where to now? The cemetery. Now here we get a music cue that we've encountered before. Secret Circle by Jerry Goldsmith. It was also used in The Hitchhiker and Nothing in the Dark, both of which dealt specifically with the personification of death. And here we are in a graveyard. It's kind of hard not to get a bit anxious at this point. Is somebody going to die? Is Alan already dead? And this is just some transitional construct where he sees what the world would have been like if he'd never been born? Spoiler alert. No, it's none of that. So he's looking for his parents' graves. Over there, the Tarbots have been buried in that plot for over 50 years. Whoa, and there's a stinger from the Moat Farm murder by Bernard Herrmann. Now, there's no Talbots listed on the headstone. Instead, it reads Walter B. Ryder and Mary F. Ryder, deceased 1929 and 1931, respectively. Man, women always live longer. <laughs> And now we get a cue from The Hitchhiker, also by Bernard Herrmann. Man, they are really going out of their way to make this episode sound like a Mr. Death affair. Now that night, in the car, Alan starts hearing the weird noises again. And this time, he also hears voices. Put it down, Alan. Get away. Run, Walter. Run. Stop the car! Are you going to be sick? Yes, hurry, stop the car! Jess pulls over, and Alan jumps out of the car and flees into some nearby woods. Look out, you'll kill me with that! Kill me with that! Kill me! Kill me! Kill! Kill! Hey, and speaking of the Outer Limits, that sounds a lot like Quarlo Klebregni's talking helmet. Attack! Kill! Attack! Kill! Attack! Did I mention The Outer Limits is coming out on Blu-ray next month? Did I mention that I'm doing three comment? Okay, yeah, I, I did. I know I did. I'm not trying to brag. I'm just fucking jazzed as hell. Anyway, Alan's hiding behind a tree, apparently suffering some sort of gnarly migraine when something comes over him. He picks up a rock. He's clearly not himself. Or is he? I guess we don't really know. He murdered somebody at the top of the episode, but he's been so charming since. I guess he wouldn't be the first serial killer with a great personality. Jess, can you give me a hand? I'm coming, Alan. Jess heads into the woods after him. As she approaches, he suddenly appears conflicted, as if part of him is trying to fight his murderous impulse. No! Get away from me! Get in the car and drive away as quick as you can. Alan, let me help you. No, I'll see you later at your apartment. How are you going to get back there? Never mind, just go! Go now, Jess! Run! She jumps in the car. He comes chasing after her, but she speeds away before he can get his hands on her. He stands there in the road, clutching his head in apparent pain, and then a pair of headlights appear behind him. He jumps out of the way just in time, but his wrist is cut. And in one of the more iconic shots found in the series, he peels back the flesh to reveal not tendons and muscles and blood, but circuitry and wires. Back at his hotel, Alan stares at his reflection in a mirror, perplexed, shaken. Who is he? What is he? He strikes a match and goes to burn himself with it to see if there'll be any pain when the phone rings. What happened? I'm not sure. Are you all right? I don't know. 
Look, Jess, why don't you just forget about me? I, I, I don't know what's going on. Listen to me. I called Dr. Matthews and I made an appointment for you for tomorrow morning. I'll be at the hotel to, to pick you up at 9.30. You'd do that after everything that's happened? Yes, I would, Mr. Talbot. I, I didn't plan on falling in love with you, but I did. And I'm stuck with it, for, for better or for worse. <sighs> On top of everything else wonderful about her, she's loyal, too. <sighs> uh, so, Alan digs out the phone book and looks up someone. We don't know who. But in the very next shot, he's approaching a house, and we see a name on the door. Walter B. Ryder Jr. He goes inside. The house is dark, quiet. He ventures further in. A shadowy figure appears behind him and follows him into the study. Hello, Alan. The shadowy figure turns on the lights. I've been waiting for you. This is Walter Ryder Jr. He's identical to Alan. Or Alan is identical to him. We don't know yet. Sit down, Alan, over there. I'll pour us a drink. Go on, sit down. There's nothing to be afraid of. By the way, you almost killed me with those scissors. Did you know that? It's a shame you didn't. Then nothing ever works out right for me. Walter shows him a jagged scar on his chest, then drops a major bomb. Exactly eight days ago, you were born here in this house. What? I made the delivery myself. You're drunk. A little bit, but not drunk enough. Will you join me? I guarantee no hangover. Wasn't that thoughtful of me? Look, I'm in no mood for jokes, mister. Well, that's a pity, because this whole thing is a joke. Would you get to the point? Well, you've been to Courville. You know that Alan Talbot never lived there. You know you've been behaving oddly of late. And judging from that handkerchief on your arm, I'd say you know about that, too. So, with all this information, what do I need to tell you? Who am I? Well, who is this watch I'm wearing? Ask me that. Who is the refrigerator in the kitchen? Don't you understand? You're a machine, Alan, a mechanical device. A perfect artificial man, not a robot. A duplicate of a human being. I created you, Alan. Is that straight enough for you? Predictably, Alan's not buying it. Now, he never descends into is this a gag territory, though, which is surprising since that's how everybody responds in the Twilight Zone. And I have to interject here. The split screen for the shots in which both characters appear is seamless. It's perfect. And George Grizzard plays both to perfection. The quote-unquote innocent Alan who doesn't know who he is, and the alcoholic and despondent Walter, who knows exactly who he is and hates himself for it. You expect me to believe I'm a machine when I know I'm not? That's ridiculous. I eat, I drink, I sleep. Didn't I tell you I wanted a perfect creation? Walter takes Alan downstairs to his lab. We see the requisite sci-fi lab equipment, plus a couple of prone human forms covered by sheets failed proto-Allen experiments. He then opens what appears to be an oven inside a brick wall. Apparently, Allen is the wood-fired variety of android. So, come on down to Papa Serling's Pizza. And then, on a nearby wall, we see a familiar sight. Walter's melange of lab equipment includes those crazy Pac-Man lights, a leftover prop from the Krell Laboratory on Altair 4 in the 1956 sci-fi classic Forbidden Planet, which of course we've seen in multiple other episodes. Interestingly, this time around the Pac-Men are pointing upwards, and this is the only time in the entire series that we see them facing that way. In I Shot an Arrow into the Air, Third from the Sun, and Elegy, they're pointing downwards, which is how they appear in Forbidden Planet. In People Are Alike All Over, they're facing sideways. Now this is the fifth appearance of these light panels on the Twilight Zone, and sadly, it's the last. So we bid thee farewell, totally bitchin' and awesome as hell Pac-Man lights. We salute you, and we thank you for your service. Godspeed.
Walter flips some switches and Alan recoils at the sound. Turn it off! A light comes on inside the brick oven, and it kind of resembles the subway tube from the prologue. Alan stares into it, clearly upset, and we wonder if perhaps the subway's similarity to the incubation chamber is what set him off in the first place. You see, I was after real intelligence. Mere reactions weren't enough. Those mannequins can react. My creation had to have a, a memory. He had to have abstract reasoning power, a past, a personality. Millions of intricate facets multiplied by millions. In certain of your cells, I made certain impressions. My own memories went into the cells. Some of my talent, some of my knowledge, bits and pieces of myself. So now you're telling me that I'm you. That's right. Oh, that's impossible. I'm me. This is my flesh. Non-conductive plastic. I admit it feels like flesh, but then that was the idea. For your past, I gave you my memories of the town. Some of them must have been inaccurate and incomplete. I left Courville 20 years ago. But... Well, Aunt Mildred. All the old ladies I've ever known rolled into one. After my parents died, I lived alone. The reputation as a Don Juan is, I regret to say, imaginary. Okay, so he wasn't really notorious for sparking the girlies. You can breathe easy now, George. Well, that's about it, Alan. The rest you can fill in up to last week anyway. What about last week? I wish I knew something went wrong. I couldn't understand. You suddenly attacked me with a pair of scissors and then ran away. As you know, I've been unable to find your sense. What's wrong with me? I'm not sure. Whatever it is, it's wrong with me, too. We're all potential murderers, Alan, all of us. But if we're normal, we're protected by our inhibitions. You've wanted to kill? Of course, everybody has. But my own inhibitions have, have held my impulses in check. I couldn't kill, no matter how much I might want to. Well, not everyone's inhibitions work. Exhibit A. Does anybody else want to fuck with the cowboy? So what do you say? With you, something went wrong. To put it even clearer, Alan, you're insane. Not defective. Not damaged. Insane. A very biological term. I told myself I wanted to make an artificial man. But I think what I really wanted was to build another Walter Ryder, only without the drawbacks. Sort of reverse Jekyll and Hyde. And, oh, Alan, he would be perfect. That was my dream, a perfect version of myself. There's somebody else, Walter, a girl. We were going to be married next week. Is she pretty? Really? That's the first thing you think of? Is she pretty? Not, is she a good person? Or... Does she have a nice personality? Or can she cook? Or does she put out? No, it's all surface, which is interesting since he created an artificial version of himself, perfect on the surface, but very much imperfect underneath. But yeah, it's Gail Kobe. So yes, Walter, you knob. She's pretty. You sure you can't fix me? Even if I could, it wouldn't solve your problems. The girl would find out eventually. How? Well, for one thing... She would grow old, and you wouldn't. For another, being a machine, you would suffer a breakdown someday. All of these things never occurred to you. I guess I didn't really think I'd succeed as well as I did. What does it matter anyway? There's nothing that can be done. Yes, there is. You're going to create another Alan Talbot. No, I just told you. You heard me, another Alan Talbot. Only this one's going to be right. And he's going to walk out of here tonight, and he's going to marry a girl named Jess. And for the first time in his miserable life, he's going to be happy. Alan writes down Jess's name and address for Walter, then sees what he's written them on. The religious tract from the prologue. He hears the noises again and erupts in another homicidal rage. As they struggle mightily, they crash into the various pieces of equipment, which throw off sparks and arcs of sizzling electricity in response. This scene is delightfully reminiscent of several such scenes in the old universal horror films, Frankenstein vs. the Wolfman and the Ghost of Frankenstein in particular. As the battle wears on, we do a slow dissolve to Jess's apartment, where there's a knock at the door. She answers. Come in, Alan. I've been so worried. After yesterday, I didn't... Uh... Well, forget yesterday. Whatever happened, forget that. But, Alan... Please. We just had a rotten nightmare, that's all. Now we're awake and everything's gonna be fine. Will you try to believe that? Okay. If you promise to tell me about it someday. I promise. Someday. Now, will you fix me a cup of coffee? Sure. 
W would you like something to eat? How about a couple of Mother Connolly's hand-fried eggs? Th they're guaranteed to make a new man out of you. <laughs> Thank you. So this is really sweet and all, but the implication is that Alan murdered Walter and will likely at some point go into another murderous rage and kill his beloved Jess too. But would the Twilight Zone really go that dark? Back at Walter's house, a body lies inert in the wreckage of the lab. As we pan in for a closer look, we see that the skin of the left wrist is peeled back, exposing circuitry and wires. Alan has been deactivated, leaving a clear path for Walter to step into Jess's arms and live happily ever after. So no, the Twilight Zone would in fact not go that dark. In a way, it can be said that Walter Ryder succeeded in his life's ambition, even though the man he created was, after all, himself. There may be easier ways to self-improvement, but sometimes it happens that the shortest distance between two points is a crooked line through the Twilight Zone. <laughs> thing that should be observed about in his image is the fact that it's an hour long instead of the customary half hour Twilight Zone format. See, after the show finished its third season, there was some discontent on both sides of the coin. CBS wasn't exactly thrilled with the show's ratings, and Serling was just plain burned out. The prospect of another season seemed dicey at best, so Serling took a teaching post at Antioch College. The fall 1962 television season started, and the Twilight Zone was nowhere to be found. But at some point, CBS did decide to order more episodes with some caveats. They wanted an hour-long show. So when the show returned to the air in January of 1963, it did so with an abbreviated 18-episode half-season. But when you math it out, it's the same runtime as a normal 36-episode season of half-hours. In His Image was the first, and it was a great choice to launch this new, revamped version of The Twilight Zone. Or just Twilight Zone, since they dropped the the... In His Image was written by Charles Beaumont, who needs no introduction around here. He graced the series with numerous classics, among them Perchance to Dream, Shadow Play, Long Live Walter Jameson, The Howling Man. He adapted In His Image from his own short story, which was first published in the February 1957 issue of Imagination Science Fiction under the title The Man Who Made Himself. It's a bit of a spoiler there. Now, the short story is pretty similar to the episode. Similar enough that I'm not going to subject you to the aural horrors of me reading it to you. The main differences are um, Alan's name is Pete Nolan and Walter's name is Walter Cummings, not Ryder. Oh, and in the unseen bit where Alan slash Pete attacks Walter slash uh, still Walter with the scissors... He carves up his face, not his chest. But otherwise, it's the same story. Now, In the director's chair is Perry Lafferty, and this is the first of three season four episodes he'd ultimately direct. He also helmed The 30 Fathom Grave and Valley of the Shadow, both of which aired directly after In His Image, in that order. So for the first three weeks of the show's new hour-long format, he was the man directing the action. And then he never worked on the show again. I'm not sure if that's significant or not. Look, here's the thing. The fourth season gets a lot of shit. The general consensus is that the episodes are overlong, dragged out, padded to hell, slow and boring, lacking the pep and snap of the earlier 25-minute version. And to an extent... Those criticisms are valid, but if you're a fan of shows like The Outer Limits or Thriller or The Alfred Hitchcock Hour, shows that also ran an hour in length, these double-wide Twilight Zones should be much more palatable. 
in his image is actually not a good example of this. Enough happens that it remains interesting throughout. And there are other season four episodes that move along pretty briskly too. Death Ship, On Thursday We Leave for Home, Printer's Devil, The New Exhibit, and He's Alive. But yeah, some of the others are unfortunately a bit slow, a bit trying. But you know what? It's still the Twilight Zone, which means you sit up and you pay attention, goddammit. Show some respect. I'm personally by no means a hater of the fourth season. There are a couple of clunkers. I Dream of Genie, The 30 Fathom Grave, even The Bard, which again, I don't hate. But you know what? None of those are as egregiously bad as some of the half-hour episodes. I'm looking at you, Mr. Beavis. Also you, four o'clock, and from Agnes with Love, too. Give me season four over those dogs any day. But evidently, CBS felt differently. When the show came back for a fifth and final season, it was scaled back to its original half-hour format. As Mark Scott Zickry observes in his Twilight Zone companion, the network's experiment had failed. Twilight Zone's expanded format had not made for an expanded audience. I mentioned earlier that actor Abraham Sofer appeared in the Outer Limits episode Demon with a Glass Hand, which incidentally also concerns, spoiler alert, a human-looking robot that, like Alan Talbot, doesn't know he slash it is in fact a robot. Now, we've already seen the female equivalent of this existential conundrum in season two's The Lateness of the Hour. The Twilight Zone's other female robots, Alicia in The Lonely and the Electric Grandmother in I Sing the Body Electric, knew what they were. And of course, Casey, that big, dumb, artificial lunk, presumably understands too, but I guess we could debate that. Now, the quote-unquote male robots and the artificial intelligence that guides them are pretty ubiquitous in sci-fi. Adam Link, Robbie the Robot, Gort, HAL 9000, R2-D2, C-3PO, Cylons, the Iron Giant, Bender from Futurama. The list goes on and on and on. But those all look like robots. Metal, rivets, blinking lights. Now, the artificial being designed to look like a human male isn't quite as commonplace historically, but has in recent years become more prevalent than its bulky, clanky predecessor, the Terminator, the synthetics in the Alien and Prometheus films, the gunslinger from Westworld, both the original film and the more recent HBO series, Data from Star Trek The Next Generation, the mechas from AI, the beleaguered synths from humans, and of course, the replicants from Blade Runner and the very recent Blade Runner 2049, all are more or less indistinguishable from human men, and more often than not, seem to exist solely for service purposes. Manual labor, security, combat, mankind isn't creating them to be peers, equals, friends, which I guess says something about mankind. They create synthetic life forms with the ability to remember and reason and sometimes even feel and then relegate them to menial tasks? You would trap us in our own minds, give us feeling, but take away free will, make us slaves. But that's the mankind of fiction. What about mankind in the real world? Surely our species has loftier, higher-minded goals, right? We're certainly making advances in robotics, but when it comes to creating convincing, functioning facsimiles of ourselves, there seems to be a single overarching goal. I'm, of course, referring to that noble endeavor to create sex robots.
Now, there are already female sex robots in existence, mostly in Japan, which we touched on back when we covered the lonely and the lateness of the hour, but there's a relatively new focus on the creation of male versions. As reported by ILFScience.com just a few weeks ago, male sex robots with bionic penises and AI could go on sale this year. No kidding, that's the title of the article, which reads, quote, Matt McMullen, CEO of Realbotics, says he's getting ready to launch AI-enhanced male sex robots. This follows the release of Harmony, the world's first interacting female sex robot last year. The male version, currently unnamed, will have all the software specifications of Harmony, as well as a bionic penis, because what would be the point otherwise? The male sex robot will come in all shapes and sizes, as the sky is the limit. The AI interface is exclusively in the robot's head. It is unclear if the AI would be able to control its bionic penis or not. Harmony's launch had several scientists considering the ethical implications of having sex with robots, and their findings weren't a particularly happy read. On social media, Harmony was seen by many as bizarre and creepy, with several people commenting how it perpetuates misogynistic ideas about sex and sexuality. The male version might not fare much better. End quote. Now, since it's a 1963 TV show, we never find out if Alan Talbot has um, functional plumbing. But Walter did say he was perfect, and Walter is a lonely guy who's probably pretty frustrated sexually, so I'm betting he would have endowed <laughs> uh, Alan with both the equipment and the ability to use it. It's very subtly implied in The Lonely that Corey and Alicia are doing the deed, because come on, of course they are. But here, well, Alan and Jess have only known each other for four days, and she was pretty clear about her limits. I told you that there were lines that I did not cross. I know, I was gonna wait till after we got married, but something came over me, I lost my self-control. So I guess we'll never know. But what we do know of In His Image is all pretty great. It's a very effective Beaumont script. The chemistry between the actors is great, especially the chemistry that George Grizzard has with himself playing both parts. That lab set is marvelous to behold. And that shot of Alan peeling back the skin of his wrist is unforgettable. In His Image is easily one of my favorite season four episodes. It's no wonder they aired it first. But I do have one lingering question. Did Walter give Alan his own fingerprints? Because there's the matter of that murdered old lady in the subway, and Alan did have to touch her to push her off the platform. I'm not sure crime scene investigation was sophisticated enough in 1963 to pull prints off a wool sweater, though, so Walter's probably safe. I mean, he is kind of responsible since he created or miscreated Alan. So the cosmic justice might be a bit out of whack in this one by giving him a happy ending with Jess. But hey, if it's the Twilight Zone's position that that shrieking Jehovah's Witness harpy had it coming, then I'm satisfied. Play ball! If we directly compare in his image against the earlier male robot centric The Mighty Casey, well, it's a total shutout. And all the tobacco spitting and cup adjusting in the world won't make a damn bit of difference. Casey never even gets a man on base. In his image wins the Twilight Zone Mandroid World Series with ease. So we are now exactly two thirds of the way through the Twilight Zone's first season. And like we did when we made it a third of the way through, well, we're gonna take some time off. 
a break, a sabbatical, a nice long microphone free nap. Actually, that's not true. I'll be working on my commentaries for season two of The Outer Limits, which will be out later this year, so I won't really be resting at all. But we will be back briefly for a very special episode in March to coincide with the season one Blu ray release of The Outer Limits. Dr. Reba Wisner and David J. Scow, two of my favorite people in the whole world, will be joining me for an Outer Limits special, so look for that. And then regular episodes of Between Light and Shadow should resume probably around late April, early May ish, roughly. But we will be back. Last time, it wasn't clear if we'd be back at all. But this time, yeah, definitely. We can't stop now, right? Until then, find us on Facebook and or Tumblr. Just search for at ZonePod and you'll find us. If you want to hit us up directly, you know, to go out back and have a catch or whatever, email us at ZonePod at gmail.com. And remember... If a robot takes time out of its busy robot schedule and does you a solid, you make damn sure you show your appreciation. You thank the kind robot. I think you know what's coming next. That's it for me. I've been Craig. This has been Between Light and Shadow, a Twilight Zone podcast. And as as always, kids, play nice. Light and shadow.